So today, we'll be in Joshua chapter 6, and I've titled today's message, The Conquest at Jericho. The Conquest at Jericho. So now, Israel has entered the promised land with the door closed behind her. The people's only path is now forward. Jericho, at nearly the lowest point on earth, it had to be conquered. The conquest of the land after Jericho was both literally and metaphorically all uphill, uphill from there. Well, in this chapter, we're going to be reading about the first fortification encountered after crossing the Jordan, the city of Jericho. It was a city that had to be subdued to gain access to the highlands because it guarded the shallowest parts of the Jordan and it sat on a strategic east-west road. What we're going to be learning about today, one of the things that I hope that this message will speak to you about is that because of the sinfulness of humanity, a wall of hostility separates God from humans and humans from one another, which can only be demolished by divinity, by God himself. So many of us, many of you know that Christ has torn down that dividing wall that separated humanity from fellowship with the Father by submitting himself to God and to abandonment. What for? That believers might be embraced by the Father. That's what we're going to be looking at overall this this morning so before we get into the first part of joshua chapter six let's pray and thank the lord for bringing us here heavenly father um you're amazing and holy and good as we just sang we are so thankful that you sent your son to to die for us when, I, when we consider how holy you are and how sinful we are, it's difficult. But Lord, the good part of it all, the good news is that your son has now made us holy as well. And you see us as holy. And we're so thankful for that. So now we ask you as we now prepare our hearts and minds for today's reading and message. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us personally. Speak to those watching and listening to this message that uh, reveal to them what it is that you have specifically for them, Lord. So now again, we ask you to bless this time we have together and speak to us, keep us safe. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 of Joshua chapter 6. And the Word of God says, Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites, no one leaving or entering. The Lord said to Joshua, Look, I have handed Jericho, its king and its best soldiers, over to you. March around the city with all the men of war circling the city one time, do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horn trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the trumpets. When there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear its sound, have all the troops give a mighty shout. Then the city wall will collapse and the troops will advance each man straight ahead. So, Josh, so Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and have seven priests carry seven trumpets in front of the Ark of the Lord. 
He said to the troops, move forward, march around the city, and have the armed men go ahead of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua had spoken to the troops, seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord moved forward and blew the trumpets. The ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. While the trumpets were blowing, the armed men went in front of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard went behind the ark. But Joshua had commanded the troops, Do not shout or let your voice be heard. Let, don't let one word come out of your mouth until the, the time I say, Shout. Then you are to shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the city, circling it once. They returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning. The priests took the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets marched in front of the ark of the Lord. While the trumpets were blowing, the armed men went in front of them, and the rear guard went behind the ark of the Lord. On the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Early on the seventh day, they started at dawn and marched around the city seven times in the same way. That was the only day they marched around the city seven times. After the seventh time, the priests blew the trumpets, and Joshua said to the troops, Shout, the Lord has given you the city. The city and everything in it are set apart for the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and everyone with her in the house will live because she hid the messengers we sent. But keep yourselves from the things set apart or you will be set apart for destruction. If you take any of those things, you will, you will, set, apart the, you will set apart the camp of Israel for destruction and make trouble for it. For all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are dedicated to the Lord and must go into the Lord's treasury. So the troops shouted and the trumpet sounded. When they heard the blast of the trumpet, the troops gave a great shout and the wall collapsed. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. They completely destroyed everything in the city with a sword. Every man, woman, both young and old, and every ox, sheep, and donkey. Right away, chapter 5 begins by telling us that the city of Jericho was on lockdown. No one can come in. No one can go out. Now, at the time, the land of Canaan was divided up among, among a number of city-states, each ruled by a king, Jericho being one of them. And later on, we'll be reading of another named Ai. Now, excavations indicate that the city covered perhaps eight acres and was protected by two high parallel walls which stood about 15 feet apart and it surrounded the city in person and more than likely even from a distance this fortress was a formidable site in fact it was cities like this like Jericho that had previously convinced Ten Jewish spies that Israel couldn't conquer the land. They wouldn't be able to conquer the land. Things were different now. The nation of Israel, they now believed that they were unstoppable because they now believed that the Lord was with them. Inside the walls of Jericho, the people were, well, by now they were aware. They were aware more than likely because of Rahab's testimony, her story. They knew about everything that Israel had gone through, everything from the Exodus to the recent victories east of the Jordan. 
It put the people in panic. Back in Exodus chapter 23, verse 27, God had promised this. I will cause, I will cause the people ahead of, ahead of you to feel terror and will throw into confusion all the nations you come to. I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you and retreat. Well, sure enough, God now was fulfilling this promise. And so now, rather than being a strong, fortified city, it really now became a doomed city. Doomed because it stood in God's land and its rightful tenants had now come to claim their property. So it wasn't really that they were fighting against a people. They were fighting now against God. Here's the thing also, church. Many things in our lives loom out as Jericho's, impending our progress in possessing our possessions, our blessings. Maybe you've been discouraged this week in the past, this whole month, with the sheer immensity of your trials. As a believer, as a Christian, let me tell you this. If you also want to see a miracle, you only have to claim the victory the Lord gives and move ahead in faith with eyes fixed upon God for success. Joshua, you see, and Israel were conquering people who made no compromise with the enemy but trusted God. They trusted God to give them the victory. Theirs was a march of triumph that put fear, the fear of God, into the hearts of the enemy. It was said that Queen Mary, the, uh, that Queen Mary of Scots feared John Knox's prayers more than she feared the, an enemy army. But is society today afraid of what God's people might do? Is society today afraid of what the church may do? Honestly, probably not. I'll tell you why. Because it's, it's mainly because the church doesn't, hasn't done very much to display the power of God to a skeptical world. The church is no longer terrible as an army with banners, as it says in, in Song of Songs 6, chapter 6, verses 4 and 10. In fact, the church is so much like the world that the world takes little notice of what we do. We imitate the world's methods. We cater to the world's appetites. And when I say we, I'm not talking about we as a church, and I hope we don't, and I hope we never will, but I'm saying a lot of American Christian churches. We imitate the world's methods. We cater to the world's appetites. We solicit the world's approval, and we measure what we do according to the world's standards. So is it any wonder, church, is it any wonder that we don't gain the world's respect? Is it any wonder? Now, in verse 2, the Lord says to Joshua, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its best soldier over to you. Notice God's language. I have handed Jericho 
over to you. From a divine perspective, Jericho is defeated before the battle is initiated because God sees the end before the beginning even begins. All that is needed is the participation of Joshua and the people of God in what God has already consummated. See, this is known as divine human instrumentality. Divine human instrumentality. Simply put, they're to do what they're told to do. March around the walls of Jericho, blow trumpets and shout, God will bring the walls down. Fellow believer, victorious Christians are people who know the promises of God. You know why? Because they spend time meditating on God's word. They believe in the promises of God because the word of God generates faith in their hearts. And they reckon. They reckon on these promises and obey what God tells them to do. Now, in case you're wondering, what do I mean by reckon? What are you, what are you talking about? You may have heard it, but let me explain. To reckon means to count as true in your life what God says about you in his word. Let me repeat that. To reckon means to count it as true in your life what God says about you in his word. Be a good cheer, Jesus told his disciples in John 16, I have overcome the world. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says this, And they that are, Christ, that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections, with the, with, uh, with the affections and lusts. In John 12, 31, we're told, Now the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Here's my point. Here's what I'm saying. My brother and sister in Christ, Christ, our Savior, has conquered the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if we reckon on this truth, we can conquer through him. You can conquer through him. It's possible to believe a promise and still not reckon on it. And obey the Lord. Leaving a promise is like accepting a check. But reckoning is like endorsing the check and cashing it. I hope that's clear to you all. Well, it's in verse 3 that the instructions are then given in a clear and systematic fashion. The military is to lead in an advanced guard fashion, followed by priests who will carry the trumpets and blow them. They will be followed by priests who will carry the Ark of the Covenant and the possession, the procession will conclude with more military who will serve as a rear guard. That's the order. And they were to follow it without any deviation. And so God orders them to march around Jericho, Jericho's walls one time each day. Not one person is supposed to make a sound. The only noise to be heard is the sound of feet shuffling, the sound of feet pounding the ground. They're not supposed to talk, chuckle, or make any noise. Their silence must have been deafening to the people of Jericho who, sti who stood on top of the walls 
and we're just looking down at them. The residents of Jericho were already experiencing the melting of their hearts like water and the total loss of courage. Undoubtedly, though, all those people, those people there in Jericho, they had participated in warfare many times. Why else would they have these fortified cities, these walls, these soldiers protecting the walls and the people there? However, they had never fought the people whose name, Israel, can be translated God fights. It came with no indication as to when they were going to be attacked. They had heard how God fought for Israel in the wilderness. He defeated two Amorite kings, Sion and Og. They had watched the children of Israel cross over the Jordan River just a few days prior because God had opened it up. They knew strange things were happening. And this silence and this silent march, I should say, added to the great suspense. What must have thrown them off even more was that all the armed men marched around like that silently for six days, six whole days. God's instructions continue in verse 4. Seven priests with trumpets are to go before the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. There were to be military personnel before the trumpet priest and behind the Ark bearing priests. Notice. The trumpets were blowing and people were shouting even before the walls fell. This parade formation suggests that God wants us to worship before he does the work. In Genesis chapter 22, there in verse 5, Abraham said to the servants, Stay here with a donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship then we, we will come back to you. Abraham knew he was about to go to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his one and only beloved son, Isaac. Instead, he said he and the boy were going up there to worship, and then they would be returning Somehow, some way, looking through the mist of mystery, Abraham anticipated God's doing, uh, God's doing uh, the work on top, on top of Mount Moriah. God doing the work on top of Mount Moriah so he can bring Isaac back to the bottom of Mount Moriah. He knew the promise of God and the God of the promise. So he decided to focus on the worship. He decided, my friends, to focus on the worship and anticipate God's doing or God doing the work. Too often, many of us expect for God to do the work first, and then we want to worship in response. We say, God bless me, and then I'll worship you. God, give me this. Give me what I'm asking for. Give me that thing I've been praying for for so long, and then I will truly worship you. Do you see what's wrong with that? We react to what God does 
instead of worshiping for God does it. The truth is, we must change the order. Worship, then expect God to work. Worship God. Worship the creator of this universe, the creator of this world, the God who is pumping blood through your body. That's allowing your lungs to breathe in the oxygen. The one is giving you life, who is blessing you with the love of your children, the love of your spouse, the love of your parent. He may not be giving you right now exactly what you want, what you've been asking for, but he is blessing you in so many other ways. Are you recognizing it? Are you seeing those blessings? That alone, the fact that you can still see the people you love, embrace them, hug them, have conversations with them, that alone should prompt you to want to worship God. Because we all know, we've all been through it. And if you haven't yet, it's only a matter of time. It's not a matter of if, but when it happens, things can change just like that. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but the person next to you could be with the Lord tomorrow. So worship God for the things he's giving you right now. Well, on the seventh day, this parade was to make seven trips around the walls of Jericho. On the seventh revolution, when, it was, when the seventh revolution was completed, the priests bearing the trumpets were to blow with an extended blast. Friends, this was the victory sound. Now, what's interesting is that they weren't told to blow the trumpets after the victory was gained. Instead, they were told, or they were to blow the trumpets before the victory was realized, before the walls fell. The blowing of the trumpets and the ensuing shouting of the people would be notes of anticipation even before there was a sign of victory would ultimately be the collapse of the walls. Now, as all this was going on, I imagine that those in Jericho, those inside the walls of Jericho, not only were living in a state of suspense because all that was going on, but maybe they also couldn't help laughing when they heard the trumpets and we're seeing the priests march around those walls, the walls, on that seventh day. Why were they possibly mocking, ridiculing, laughing? Because nothing victorious had occurred yet. Friends, do you see what this is? It's a picture of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1, in the King James Version says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As believers, we must exercise faith, not passively, but actively. We must shout in anticipation of deliverance. We must shout in expectation of recovery. We must shout in celebration of overcoming one day. See, anybody, anyone can shout after the walls fall. Can we shout before they fall? knowing that they will fall because God said they would? Would 
shout before or after. Well, God then instructs this group again to march around the walls each, once each day for six days and the seventh day we saw that um, seven times. That's 13 revolutions. That's 13 times going around the city of Jericho. Why all this marching? Couldn't God have just brought down the walls after one time around on the first day? Yes, he could have. But it's also possible that God wanted his military regime and these priests to become so acquainted with the massive walls that they would recognize the building components were not shifting with each successive revolution. He wanted them to see the walls were still intact. They're not, they weren't cracking. They still were as strong as the first day. The stones in that wall weren't weakened. The stones were just as intact upon the completion of the 13th round as they were when they made their first circuit. So isn't it also possible that he wanted them to see that they were helpless in gaining entrance to Jericho without him? Could it be that God wanted them to realize without, his, without him telling them that the walls were to fall, he would have to bring them down himself. This is a lesson, another lesson here, that believers, Christians need to learn today. The power to defeat our Jerichos will not come through our methods, skills, reputations, titles, or any of the things we take pride in doing in order to be victorious. God will have to do it. God will have to do it. There must be things in our lives that we can look back and say, I never would have made it without God. God must be the only explanation for deliverance not education, money, good looks, strong families, or any other props. The only answer we must be able to provide sometimes or most of the time is God did it. God did it. That should be the answer. The question that, reminds is, that remains is, how many times must we march around Jericho before we realize our dependence on the King of Kings? Israel walked 13 revolutions. How many will you need? Will you, will you need 30? Will you need 300? How many will you need? How many will you need before you finally realize that it's not by strength or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. Now, another thing I want you to notice there in verse 5 is that the uh, verse 5 begins with the word when. When there's a prolonged blast of the horn. Now, I mentioned this, and it's important because of what follows, uh, what follows is the when. What follows the when is the then. Then the city wall will collapse. When and then. When and then. 
See, when we do what God has told us to do, which is obedience, then we can expect that God will do what he said he would do. We have no reason to expect the then of God until we have carried out the when of our responsibility. I hope that makes sense. I hope that's clear to you. So Joshua gives the instru- exact instructions he had received from the Lord to the priest and the military leaders. They instruct the people about their responsibilities in this warfare enterprise, in this military campaign. This meant that everyone, and that means everyone, all, was to be involved. Everyone had a part to play. Joshua makes it crystal clear in verse 10 that no one is to make a sound as they marched around the wall. In verse 10, they weren't to raise their voices until the seventh day when it was time for them to shout. It wasn't until each go around that the participants in the parade around the wall that they could retire for the night and rest. Now imagine being the spouse, the wife, or the child of one of those soldiers that had been marching around that wall. How interesting that that dinner conversation would have been. Now, just to be clear, this parade, it wasn't like the Thanksgiving Day Parade, Macy's Parade, that you see in Times Square every Thanksgiving. Rather, it was a parade in an arid atmosphere on uneven soil and rocky ground. Nevertheless, He told them to march around one time each day for the first six days. And again, this gave every person the chance to share his thoughts with his family and friends. They could tell their family members and friends about the faces of the people of Jericho, what they looked like as they leaned over the walls and watched that mysterious march. If there were jeers and ridicule from the people standing on the walls, that might be another story they may be able to share with their friends and family. But most of all, they could share with them what they sensed God was up to as they marched around the walls in total silence. Friends, the drama was real. The drama was real, folks. So we see in verse 12 that Joshua got up early the second morning and had the march continue for the second day. The next verse, verse 13, recounts the priests resuming their positions and carrying their trumpets as they continue to march. Well, this march, again, it continued on for six consecutive days. And then there on the seventh day, They marched around seven times. But now, but now, they were to do more on the seventh day that they had had done for the first six days. So see, it was totally different. The first six days, just once. Now, after this, uh, now they were told to march seven times on that seventh day. After the seventh time around the walls on the seventh day, Joshua commanded the people to shout. So he announced that the Lord had given the people the city. And so this movement went from silence to sound. Church, God is both silence and sound again too many too often our churches 
in our churches, we discern the presence of God, of God only in sound or noise. We only, a lot of churches out there who only believe that God only speaks when there's sound or noise is going on. Or two, or many churches, many Christians are too uncomfortable with silence. And I mentioned this, I think it was during our introduction, but for many believers, when there's the absence of sound and the presence of silence, they simply say, the worship is dead. Yet, let me tell you this, there must be a time in worship for silent meditation. We usually do this mostly during communion. I tell you, just to spend a few minutes, a couple minutes in, in silence to make your heart right with the Lord. But there has to be, during church service, even in your own time, for silent meditation, contemplation, let me see if I say this word correctly, cogitation. In fact, the more we percolate about the goodness of the Lord and what He has done for, the, for us, the more we tend to celebrate. The more experience we have in solitude and quietness, the stronger we will be when it's, ta- when it's time to make a joyful noise. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20 says, The Lord is in His holy temple. Let the whole earth be silent in His presence. I also love what David wrote in Psalm 150 verse 6. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Like David We Christians love to praise the Lord with all kinds of instruments and flutes and all kinds of things. And it's okay. However, God is also in silence. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, it says this, The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. In fact, Mary, the mother of Jesus, simultaneously and inextricably, inextricably, held silence and sound together. On one hand, it was great silence after the angel Gabriel informed her that she would be the mother of the Son of God. She pondered these things in her heart. This is silence. She meditated and contemplated what the angel said to her. But on the other hand, she expressed, she expressed sound in the Magnificent, saying, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. There in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47. So here's what I'm saying. Silence and sound are not antithetical. They are commensurate. Both are absolutely necessary. Silence and sound. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. What am I doing? All right. What we see again, Joshua tells the people what God has told them. And his entire city, with all of its possession, was to be devoted to the Lord. So although the city was to be destroyed, 
all the valuable articles were to be devoted to the treasury of the Lord, uh, to be used in the building of a future, a few, a future tabernacle. And the only persons that were to be saved or spared from the destruction were Rahab and all the family members that had gathered at her house where the scarlet cord could be seen hang, hanging out the window. Verse 18, the concepts of devotion and destruction converge and collide. God says that people are to keep away from devoted things, those valuable metals those, and other articles that are to be saved for, and that they're to be saved for the building of the tabernacle so that they will not be destroyed and bring trouble to the nation. And so God was saying that the only way for the Israelites to avoid destruction is to avoid taking those things that were devoid, devoted for tabernacle usage. Silver, gold, bronze, and iron are specified. Well, let me, let me, um, let me read the next section here. Let me just see how, how far we can go. Joshua chapter 6. Read from 20 to the, to the end. Joshua said to the men who had scouted the land, Go to the prostitute's house and bring the woman out of there and all who are with her, just as you swore to her. So the young men who had scouted went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her whole family and settled them outside the camp of Israel. They burned the city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and, all, all, all the, and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. However, Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, her father's family and all who belonged to her because she hid the messengers. She hid the messengers Joshua had sent to spy on Jericho and she still lives in Israel today. At the time Joshua imposed this curse, the man who undertakes the rebuilding of the city Jericho is cursed before the Lord. He will lay its foundation at the cost of his firstborn. He will finish its gates at the cost of his youngest. And the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Now, when the walls of Jericho fell down, it appears that the section of the wall that held Rahab's house, it didn't fall down. It wasn't necessary for the spies to look for a window with a red cord hanging from it because it was the only house that was preserved when that entire wall fell. When, this, when their spies made their covenant with Rahab, they didn't know exactly how God would give them the city. But here's the point. God saved and protected Rahab Again, because of her faith. And because she led her family to trust in Jehovah, in God, they were also saved. And Rahab and the relatives were put outside the camp because they were unclean Gentiles. And outside the camp was a place designated for, unclean, for the unclean. Those men in that family would have to be circumcised in order to be sons of the covenant and all the family, entire family would have to submit to the law of Moses. What grace that God, it was grace, the grace of God that spared Rahab and her loved ones. Now, here's what I wanted to make sure I bring up here in this message that last part there in or the middle part of verse of this last section we read I know that it may disturb some people that God commanded every living thing in Jericho to be killed and you may be saying isn't our God isn't God a God of mercy after all, it's one thing for the Jews to kill the enemy soldiers, but why? But why kill 
women, children, or even the animals, those poor little cows, the sheep, the oxen. Why kill the little chickens? Why kill them? Well, to begin with, this commandment, it wasn't a new one. The Lord had given it to Moses years before. In the divine law found in Deuteronomy chapter 20, the Lord made a distinction between attacking cities that were far off and cities in the land of Canaan where Israel would dwell. So before besieging a city that was far away, the Jews were to give that city an offer of peace. And if that city surrendered, the Jews would spare the people and make them subjects. But it wasn't that way with the, with the cities and the land of Canaan. The land that they were supposed to possess and own, the promised land, those people were to be destroyed completely and their cities burnt to the ground. Why? For one thing, the civilization of Canaan was, unexpect, was unspeakably wicked. Unspeakably wicked. And God didn't want his holy people contaminated by their neighbors. We must never forget that God put Israel in the world to be the channel for his blessing which involves, among other things, the writings of the scripture and the coming of the Savior. Read the Old Testament record, and you will see Satan doing everything he could to pollute the Jewish nation, and thus trying to prevent the birth of the Messiah. When the Jewish men married pagan women and began, uh, and began to worship pagan gods, it was a threat to the purposes God had for his chosen people. God wanted a holy seed so that his, his holy son could come to be the savior of the world. God is perpetually at war with sin, said G. Morgan Campbell. That's the whole explanation of the extermination of the, of the Canaanites because the Jews didn't fully obey this command in later years, it led to national defilement and divine chastening. The book of Judges would not be in the Bible if the nation of Israel had remained true to the Lord. But there's a second consideration. The people in the land had been given plenty of opportunity to repent and turn to the Lord just as Rahab and her family had done. God patiently endured the evil of the Canaanites from the time of Abraham to the time of Moses, a period of 400 years. From the Exodus to the crossing of the Jordan was another 40 years in Israel's history. And the Canaanites, they knew, they knew what was going on. Ever wondered, every, I'm sorry, every wonder that God performed and every victory that God gave his people was a witness to the people of the land. But they preferred to go on in their sins and reject the mercy of God. And we know that they could have accepted the mercy of God because Rahab did. Rahab accepted it. Never think that the Canaanites were helpless, ignorant people who knew nothing about the true God. They were willfully sinning against a flood of light. We should keep in mind that these historical events were written for our learning, as it says in Romans 15:4, as we seek to live for Christ today. In the destruction of Jericho and its population, God is telling us that he will tolerate no compromise 
with sin in the lives of his people. He will tolerate no compromise with sin in the lives of his people. To quote Campbell Morgan again, thank God that he will not make peace with sin in my heart. I bless his name for the thunder of his authority and for the profound conviction that he is fierce and furious in his anger against sin whenever it manifests itself. Verse 24 ought to remind us of the words spoken by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. For the Lord your God is consuming fire, a jealous God. Church, God is jealous over his people, and he will not permit them to divide their love and service between him and the false gods of this world. If you don't know this already, then you should know this. We cannot serve two masters. Jericho was a wicked city, and sin is only fuel for the holy wrath of God. In Matthew 13 and 25, Jesus compared hell to a furnace of fire that is eternal. And John compared it to a lake of fire. John the Baptist described God's judgment as unquenchable fire. The burning of Jericho, like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, is a picture of the judgment of God that will fall on all who reject truth. The last section of this section of this chapter tells us that. After he had burned the city, Joshua put a curse on Jericho. This would, again, be a warning, uh, warn any Jews or any of Rahab's descendants who might be tempted to rebuild that city that God had destroyed. Well, that curse was fulfilled in the days of evil King Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16. Let me end with this. Later, talking about New Testament times, Jesus would minister in the city of Jericho, even though it was a cursed city. This is good news for sinners. This is good news for sinners. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and he was probably sort of like the director of the IRS in Jericho. He was considered a cursed person by the Jews who despised and hated him. But Jesus went to Zacchaeus there in Luke chapter 19. He went to his house, changed him, and declared that he now was a son of Abraham. See, God is able to bring a blessing out of a curse. Light out of darkness and beauty out of ashes. You're not a mistake. You're not, you weren't brought to this earth, to this world for no reason. You have a purpose and God wants to reveal that purpose to you. Church, let's remember this. Whenever we feel down, we're allowing the enemy to bring us down. Let's really remember who we are. There's no more curse. We've been freed of that. That curse is death. And when when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, he freed you from the shackles of sin and death. He brought a blessing out of a, of a, out of a curse, light out of darkness. And he brought beauty out of ashes. If you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
you want to be saved. You want Jesus to come into your heart and change your life forever. I invite you to the cross so you can lay your sins and before him and allow him to forgive you. That's what he went to the cross for. So if you're ready to do that, you're ready right now, and you no longer want to wait another day, another week. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head, and with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you. And you alone is my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me, for forgiving me, for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. Amen. If you sincerely pray that, you're now a child of God. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. I pray that you will have a blessed week. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week as we cover Chapter 7. Have a great week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.